Recently, I gave a lecture on the importance of racial and ethnic diversity in public health leadership to a group of graduate students. At the end of that lecture, a student asked me, how do you take care of yourself, given the fact that public health is pretty hard work and you don't always see the results of your efforts? I paused for a moment, thought I had a quick, smart answer for her, but I didn't. And I had to admit, I actually have no idea. And I shared with them a story. I had recently at att attended a racial equity training at work, and in that training, we were told that blacks have the worst health outcomes than any other ethnic group in every system in society. As a black woman, that information was very upsetting to me. I was very sad and a little bit angry. I was talking to a group of coworkers afterwards about what we had learned. And one of my coworkers, Tiffany, who I respect so very much, said something to me that stuck with me. She said, the problem is that when they see numbers, we see faces. And she's absolutely right. In my public health work, I've worked on things like sexually transmitted disease prevention, violence prevention, infant and maternal mortality. And I often think about my friends, my family, the people in my neighborhood that I see every day. And in that moment, I realized that my lived experience and my professional experience, coupled with my um, built environment work, has a great impact on what and how I teach, and that diversity and representation is important in academia. It has occurred to me that I might be the first black teacher that many of my students have ever had. At yet another training on structural racism, we were told to turn to our neighbors and talk about the first time we had our first black teacher. So I found someone next to me and I got so excited and shared that my first black teacher was Miss Oates in kindergarten. She was a tall, slender, graceful black woman. And I remember being so excited to see her in class and learn. My first grade teacher, Miss Phillips, my second grade teacher, Miss Parker, third grade teacher, Miss Washington, fourth grade teacher, Mr. Manzanares, and my fifth and sixth grade teacher, Mr. Williams, were all black. My principal, Ms. Starr, was a black woman. My music teacher, Mr. Coates, was a black man. All of my teachers in elementary school were black. In middle school and high school, I still had a really good number of black teachers. Ms. Miles, my science teacher, was black. And Ms. Broussard was my math teacher. So as I finished you know, ruminating about all my black teachers, I turned to my neighbor and my neighbor said, I had my first black teacher in college. We literally had the exact opposite experience growing up. And we talked about what that meant, the impact of that difference. A recent study shows that black students who have black teachers have greater success in high school and they actually graduate and do well in college. If black teachers have such a great impact on black students, imagine the impact that black teachers can have for all students. I only had one black professor in college. Back then, believe it or not, I was a very quiet student. I didn't have much to say, but I had a good excuse. During my freshman year at the age of 19, I became a single mother. I gave birth to a daughter eight weeks early. She was three pounds, 11 ounces. So I think I, I'm okay, I had, I had a good reason to be a little occupied with things during college. This was well before the Affordable Care Act and my parents' health insurance denied my daughter coverage. I had to get on Medi-Cal to pay her $40,000 hospital bill. So as I walk into class one day, my professor says to me, or to the class, what do you think of when you hear the term healthy families? And there were a variety of responses. A two-parent family is a healthy family. A family that has all the resources they need to thrive is a healthy family. And I'm sitting there thinking, ain't she talking about the low-income uh, program, health insurance program for low-income people? But I didn't say anything because, once again, I had a lot going on and I didn't want to be wrong, and so I stayed quiet. 
sure enough, she was talking about the low income health insurance program um, that are available for residents. Imagine how robust that conversation could have been if my teacher had taken the time to get to know who I was. We would have been able to talk about the concepts in class regarding low income health insurance programs and actually have a real life example of that in my experience. I've been teaching for about 10 years now. I teach health and public health, and I've done it in both in-person and online settings. Here at Occidental College, I te teach an introductory public health course. I love public health. I teach about the history of public health, the basics of public health, the focus on prevention, the focus on community. We talk about politics and their importance in public health. And we also talk about very sensitive topics like racism and its impact on health outcomes. We talk about poverty, and we talk about the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of, he of health are those things that aren't health related that have huge impact on health outcomes. One of the things that's very important to me as an instructor is to make sure that not only do I share my lived experience with my students, but that I also help them understand that their lived experience also is relevant to public health. One example is the lecture I give on the relationship between educational attainment and health outcomes. One of the things I usually do is ask the students, how has your educational experience helped or harmed your health? And I get a variety of responses. Some students tell me they had to shut the water fountains off because the water was contaminated, or the ceiling tiles were falling down, or we only got abstinence-only sex education in school. There are some students also that have really great experiences and have, have had wonderful opportunities to move forward in their education. I then talk to them about my experiences, how in ninth grade a classmate was pregnant or the difference between my experience in public school and parochial school, and how both of those experiences have shaped my life. We then talk about and watch a film related to the health disparities or the educational disparities and how those disparities are wider now than they were 50 years ago. It's very important to help them see those concepts as they move forward and hopefully become future public health ambassadors. So going back to that lecture, that grad school lecture, sometimes I say too much. And as I was walking away from that lecture, I wondered if my answer was a little too rough, a little too much for the students. Maybe I had gone too far. And as I walked away, a young lady ran up behind me and caught up to me and said, Professor Vic, thank you so much. I knew exactly what you were talking about. I just had not been able to put it into words. I often feel the same way that you do. Thank you so much. And in that moment, I was very sure that I was in the right place doing the right thing. As a professor, it is my responsibility to teach the foundation, the basics of the topics that I'm presenting to the class. But I would be doing them a disservice if I did not share my lived experience and relevance of the lived experience and their lived experience in the work that I'm doing to help them see the faces and not just the numbers. Thank you.